welcome back to Reclaim You. I'm here with Robin today, and I'm so excited to talk more about body image. And uh, before we started recording, we were talking about medical settings, kind of picking up on where Rachel and I left off a couple of episodes ago. And Robin was mentioning, you know, kids and medical care and weight charts and so many things. And I thought that would be a really great place to start off with in this episode, talking all about body positive homes and raising kids in this shitty culture that we live in. So all that to say, welcome, Robin. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this with you. I'm excited. I'm so excited too. So one question that I've been asking everyone that comes on is what does Reclaim You mean to you? Yes. Oh my gosh. I love this question. I love that you asked this. Um, And I think that like, you know, as far as like my practice with into nutrition therapy, it's so similar to Reclaim You. Um, It's just the idea that again, like we're bombarded from an early age and all the time from like everywhere about messages about our bodies and messages about food and messages about like what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing using like these external sources and like inanimate objects to tell us how we should be feeling about our body right um and it's just it gets so out of control and it's just like so loud right there's so much noise around it um so to me it really just means like shutting down that noise like trying to like no longer use a lot of those like apps scales and things that are giving you information that isn't even really all that accurate or helpful and saying like okay you know I'm weighing myself and the number is making me feel really badly about myself like let's not do that anymore you know there's no reason to do that um or like an app that's telling you how many calories you should have but you're starving because you're probably not having a lot of fat because that has more calories right so like tuning all of that out and getting back in touch with ourselves and trusting like that body again like going back to us being born into this world with this innate ability to do so for people who have you know really you know severe eating disorders this is really hard to do and it's almost impossible at first so like you know that's the work that we do with people but you know for a lot of people just finally getting back in touch with yourself and saying okay you can even talk to yourself in third person like what do you need right now? What are you What are you telling me? What are you feeling? Like, do you need a snack? Like, being able to just get back in touch with yourself and reclaim this ability to, like, trust yourself and listen to your body because your body is giving you all the information that you need. And we just need to, like, tune that noise out around us and tune in to what is being, what our bodies are actually telling us that we need and trusting that. I love that. So talk to us a little bit, like I said, to start about medical settings and what can kind of come when bringing your kids just for a well visit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it, it can be really tricky. So we go to these doctor's visits, right? And, you know, what we know as far as like the weight piece is that it's really focused on, it's really emphasized. And I think what happens is that, you know, because we live in such a weight-centric, weight-normative kind of model, weight becomes one of the most important things that is discussed at these visits. And it can leave parents feeling really, like, confused or, like, worried that they're doing something wrong. Like, you know, we see how our kids are trending on the growth chart and, like, if there's, like, you know, like, all the little squiggles and, like, it's just... Sometimes it can be like really, I guess, scary for people to be like, oh, like, is this normal? Is this okay? And then, you know, there's a lot of talk about it. And there's a lot of talk in front of kids. And, you know, as far as kids are concerned, they pick up on things really, really early. Um, You know, I have a four-year-old and a -a two-and-a-half-year-old. And they understand a lot. I mean, of course, especially my four-year-old, you know, and like all these conversations that are being had in front of her and in front of other kids, especially as they get older, are really harmful. Um, And this is important because, you know, I actually have a lot of clients. So I work with a lot of parents and I work with a lot of teens and, you know, and a bunch of other people, like all the different age groups. But I would say that a lot of people, like more often than not, People will say, you know, 
they can remember a time that a doctor or a nurse or like a healthcare provider said something to them or about them in this setting. And then that starts, you know, the whole like parents go home, take that information, start putting them like on restrictive diets, like make, like whether they talk to them about it or they just do it, you know, like it becomes a really, really, really like unhealthy atmosphere, like environment for them. And so that just starts the whole cycle, right? Like they go to the doctor, then they have to home, then at school there's stuff, and it's just impossible to navigate. So, you know, as far as the medical setting for kids, not saying that weight should never be taken, that it's not important, it is. And of course, we need weights for dosing medications, and we do want to look at trends, but that's more what we should focus on, right? Like looking at trends, like not right. just looking at a single data point and saying, ooh, you're at the 95th percentile, you know, like you should probably make some changes, you know, without even asking parents or kids hey, like, what foods are you eating? What do you like to eat? What have you tried recently? Like, what's your favorite food? You know, there's no conversation around how we're feeding our kids and what they like. It's just like, oh, this single data point is telling me that your weight is too high and that needs to be fixed. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then kids, like you said, they pick up on so much. I, it's funny. I also, Robin and I are both moms. We have kids that are the same exact ages actually. And so, yeah, my four-year-old picks up on so much as well. And I mean, even working with clients, we hear all the time, these initial memories going back to medical settings of overhearing, like you said, this doctor said that there was something wrong or that my weight was too high or my BMI was X, Y, and Z. And it kind of plants this seed of there's something wrong with me at such, Mm -hmm. such an early age. And then how parents respond to that and then how kids take that and how it roots in over time and informs behaviors. It's so impactful, more so than I think definitely anyone realizes, you know, in the traditional medical setting. Big time. And, you know, what's also really important to kind of mention here is that, you know, a lot of research and data that shows that, you know, elementary school kids, like girls especially, not that, you know, I don't think anybody's like immune to it, but more so girls than boys, that, you know, 40 to 60% or so of kids aged 6 to 12 are fearful of being fat, right? They're like, so their body changing and they are worried about how they look. And there's just this preoccupation with it at such an early age you know, and then the things that the kids learn in school too, or like kids are already bullied about their weight and then like bullied by parents, you know, maybe parents don't even realize they're bullying kids, but they are, right? Like sometimes we are innocuous or really not, you know, how we talk about our kids and how we talk to our kids becomes their inner dialogue. You know, they're sponges absorbing all this information. So, you know, they hear all of this and then they, you know, kids are already so, vulnerable and then you know they go to school and then they get all this information like you know about how they look and not a single person I don't know about you but like I always think about this from when I was a kid too like not a single person ever mentioned to me or said to me hey your body is going to change so many times you're supposed to change and bodies are going to change at different rates, right? Like your body might change at a different pace than your friend's body and like your peers' bodies and all bodies are good. Like all bodies are changing over and over and over again. Like nobody says this to kids. And so they see their bodies changing and then, you know, you know, some kid or like an uncle or an aunt or a sibling or a parent says, oh, like your belly's getting big or look at your leg, like those types of things. And you would be surprised at how many times, you know, a comment like that is what spirals people into these harmful, like horrible eating patterns that eat them for a really long time, some for life, you know, it's really hard to work through. Absolutely. Which is why it feels so important to have these conversations and to support, you know, adult humans in the world to do different with their own kids. You know, it's yeah. funny when one of my very close friends, she sent me a message one day and just said like, oh my God, I just screwed up so bad. I brought my daughter out 
to McDonald's and then we went to the doctor's office and she stepped on the scale and I, and I made a comment just like my mom would make of like, mm-hmm. I, I bet you regret having that now. And she immediately thought like, holy shit, what the fuck did I just do? Right. And we get, you know, it's so, so easy to fall into these old patterns of what our parents did and what the culture says without yeah. doing this kind of depth of work to fall back into those similar behaviors and patterns that then inform our kids' views of themselves and their bodies and other people's bodies and things like that. So yeah, these conversations feel so important to help parents find their way out, you know, and to do some of this work to create more supportive environments for their families and for future families. Yeah, big time. Um, I think the one thing though that's different about your friend, which comes to mind for me right away, is that she was able to recognize that, right? Like, you know, I know like for my parents, you know, and again, like wonderful parents, and, you know, yep. like, I think that this is what, this is why it's important to have this conversation is because parents have good intentions. Like they don't mean to cause harm and it doesn't mean that harm wasn't caused, right? right? So as far as your friend, she was able to be like, oh my God, why did I say that? Like, this is so harmful. And I think that's the difference is that we're kind of in this like generation, I think now um, with, you know, there is a lot on social media, which is really positive and great. And that's like helping us to kind of like learn a lot of this, but you know, it was different for our parents. Um, But your friend is able to recognize this. And I think that is where she needs to run with it. Right. Saying to our kids, like apologizing to our kids or saying something to our kids. I actually had a similar situation recently. I was telling some friends. So we were reading a book. I was reading a book with my kids um, about snowmen. There's one snowman that is different. Yeah, there's one snowman has like a cucumber nose. And so like, you know, my kids pointed to that and they like, you know, thought it was like really silly. And so we kind of like went with it. And I'm like, we said it was silly. And then at the end, I was like, oh my God, like, what am I doing? Here I am. Like we're like we're like almost like poking fun at this snowman who's different. So then I was like, okay, wait a second. Like we need to go back here. And then there's like a whole lesson. Like okay, like you know, talking about how you know like bodies are different. You know, people look different. It doesn't mean that it's bad to be different. And I like I kind of used it as like a you know a lesson for my daughter. And I was like, you know, does anybody look different in your class? And she said yes. And we like talked about that. And I asked if like anybody ever says anything to this person. And I was like, that's great. Like, it's really cool to be different. We're supposed to be unique. And how cool is it that the snowman has a cucumber nose when all the other ones have carrots? And we talked about, like, this is actually when, like, people were getting a lot of snow. And I was like, what kind of nose do you want to put in our snowman that we make? You know, like, trying to, like, sit around. But I was just like, oh, my God. Like, even I found myself in this situation where like it's just so easy it's so easy some of these mistakes where you're like oh my god that's not the lesson that I wanted to teach them or like that's not what but I think apologies or like like switching things around or lessons go a long way with kids because I know that like moving forward like now when we look at the book she's like oh it's really cool that the snowman has a cucumber nose you know what like, I not said that I don't know like maybe she wouldn't have come to that conclusion right like yeah silly um and obviously this is just like about a snowman we don't do that with people but you know it's still really yeah. important to, like think about it you know you don't realize again since kids are sponges and they're like absorbing all of this information you don't know how it's you know being internalized for them and where they're going to take that information at, you know like i don't ever want my kids to point to somebody who's different and we were just talking about like body body positive homes that's one thing that I really stress to parents and I think it's so important is that representation matters so much so if you are reading books with your kids that show all sorts of different bodies and ethnicities and cultures and all the things you know when they're out in the world they see people you know who are different from them not going to point to somebody and be like oh why is that person this or why is that person that and for sure for people who aren't doing that you can have those conversations with your kids it's sometimes harder and more challenging if you're already like doing these things in your home 
they're not going to have that same response. And they're going to see people as like people, like, yeah. you know, they're used to seeing all different bodies and, you know, people in wheelchairs, you know, like all sorts of things. Yeah. And maybe we can add some of your favorite books, some of my books as well to the show notes to help people kind of access some of those different types of books for, for their kids. What are some other ways do you feel like some even like foundational ways to start to shift homes to be super safe and body positive and really encouraging for kids to explore, you know, their bodies, other bodies. Yeah, I love that question. Um, So important. And there's actually so many things that we can do, which is great. So, you know, again, like first thing, representation matters. So being mindful of that. And also, you know, like checking in with yourself and, you know, I think, a hard thing for parents is when they have their own, you know, like complicated relationship with food and body, like where their body image isn't great or like they've been through so much as far as like their body and food relationship and they don't want to pass it on to kids, but like they don't realize that they kind of are in some ways. So I think one of the things that you're doing, I think like first thing is awareness, right? Like, do you have food rules? Like, are you like saying things like, you know, you have to have this before that, or like, you can't eat after this hour, like, not only for yourself, but are you kind of like passing those on to your kids too? So like, what food rules are present in your home? Um, You know, like a lot of parents, and this is like kind of how we were raised too, I think, for the most part, like you have to do vegetables before you get something sweet. That's one thing that I start with, actually, with a lot of my families is Because that oftentimes creates this like preoccupation with that food and like it just makes them want it so much more. And this can be really hard and really scary for people because this is not how we were raised. And like it's just, you know, there's so much around this like, you know, you shouldn't have too much sugar, you shouldn't have too much this. So like putting food on the plate that like is kind of not what you would consider healthy dishes can feel really scary and like parents feel overwhelmed and out of control with that. That's ultimately what helps is serving the thing with your meal. And you know, at first, oftentimes kids will go for that first, right? They will go for the ice cream, they will go for like the whatever. But as you do it more and more, it doesn't mean that you have to offer, you know, like a cookie or ice cream or whatever with every single meal, like, or even every day if you don't want to, like you can control how often you, you offer it. But when you do offer it, offer it as though you're offering like whatever other food it is, veggies, fruit, whatever. Like what's your, like, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Mine's this, like, do you like sprinkles? Like, do you, you know, like have a conversation about it. But what happens is that, you know, parents sometimes maybe even do that. Like they will allow the sweet with the meal, but they won't have it themselves. And they'll see something like, oh, like mommy can't have that or daddy can't have that. I'm watching my weight. You don't have to watch your weight, but I'm watching my weight, right? I've had this conversation with so many parents um, of clients of mine. They don't realize that like that too is causing harm. And it's like, and just to say this too, like it is so hard. And so like, this is, especially if this isn't something that you're used to thinking about, it can feel as a parent, like, okay, like what am I supposed to say then? (laughs) What do I do? And what do I say? I don't ever want parents to feel that way. Like, I know that it can just feel so overwhelming. Just think like the awareness is really important first. If you hear yourself saying like, I can't have that or like, I'm watching my weight or I'm on a diet or like, do you really need to have that much? Or like all those comments really impact us. But also kids aren't all the same. There's no, there's no one size fits all approach. Like you can try a lot of these things and they might go really well for them. But, you know, there are different things that we have to consider too, you know, like some kids do have kids who are autistic or like, you know, kids who are, have celiac or different medical conditions or different things that you you can still do a lot of these things, but it might not look the same way. You know, that's important to know too. When you're saying that, I had the thought of the comment that I remember hearing 
so often and probably still as an adult is I'm so bad for having X, Y, Z, right? Or, you know, you guys have the pizza. I'm just going to have the salad instead. And well, like maybe you're not in the mood for pizza, you know, are there other intentions behind it? Is there this avoidance or like you said, morality of the food? Is it considered good or bad? Or is there compensation around it? All of these things to get to know within ourselves, because when it's there for ourselves and it's being said or demonstrated to our kids, like you said, there's little sponges that are going to pick up on it. And what meaning might they, might they make about their body by hearing us reference our bodies in those ways? It's really hard. Like you said, it's really, really hard. It's really tricky to navigate. And that awareness and the curiosity around like, oh, wow, what's happening for me here can be really game changing. Yeah, so much so. And yeah, like the, the comment about being bad, it's like, it's, you hear it all the time. Uh-huh. Right? It's so sad that we like live in a society that like, people call themselves bad. I mean, I used to do the same thing, you know, mm-hmm. um, but people call themselves bad for like eating a cookie. Like you didn't rob a bank. Like you didn't tell anybody. You didn't like hurt someone. Like you just ate something that is tasty, right? Yep. Like perspective, like really overwhelming to people when they, you know, because you know, so many of us started dieting at really early ages. I mean, I know for myself, I was around like 11 or 12, like right there point of like puberty right like during when your time, body was going to rapidly change yeah rapidly changing and you know it feels so scary because nobody's normalizing that for you um and that is really when I started dieting and like for a really long time like throughout college throughout like you know early adulthood for most of my life and so like a lot of that is because of messages that I got about my own body or my that I overheard my loved ones saying about their bodies, messages that I got from doctors, messages that I got from peers, like, you know, assignments that we did in school, like all these things. And so like, it, like sometimes it's, it can start with just like one simple comment. That being said, again, like, that's where the awareness of parents makes the biggest difference because we can say, Hey, I wanted to talk to you about something, you know, like the other day I said X, like, you know, how did that make you feel? Or like, did like, you can kind of gauge the situation. (laughs) Having those conversations is what helps them to build resilience, you know, and like a strong foundation to be able to navigate this better. So that when they are in comments from other people, they already have these tools and these, you know, this information to be able to like not get carried away with it. Not to say that like you're doomed as parents if you said something, your kids are doomed <laughs> if you commented. Like it's okay. Like it's we do it, you know, it's um, unfortunately part of what people do. And there are things to help them not develop negative patterns or like a negative relationship with food in their body. Yeah. And you mentioned schools. That's such a, that's such a good point because so much happens in the school environment with, I'm thinking about health class and gym class, I guess. Yeah. They're two separate classes, you know, and tracking food and going to the nurse's office to get weighed and how that for so many little kids and, you know, I don't know how old they go doing this now, but, you know, it's so triggering and it's so hard. And so I'm curious if you have tips for parents of how to navigate that when your child is being faced with an assignment to track their calories, because this happens, right? Or you get the letter in the mail to check the the BMI or the weight or whatever it is. How do we as parents navigate that with the goal of supporting our kids to stay resilient and to maintain the integrity of our homes as safe spaces. Yeah. I love that you asked this because it is a really important conversation. Um, and even before we talk about like, you know, like great people, a really good friend of mine, um, like a couple of years ago at this point, her daughter is, um, but when her daughter was two, like two, two, two and a half in daycare, like, <sighs> It starts so early. The like teachers were having them classify food as like healthy, unhealthy, and you're just like, oh my god, right? Like, starts so early. You know, we're like going back to this whole like teachers have such good intentions. Like they're not trying to like mess the kids up. Right, of course. 
we think that if we teach kids, like, hey, this is healthy and this is not healthy, that's going to make them healthy. But like the opposite happens, right? They start, they actually do start fearing foods. Like, so like when we get to like kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and you know, above, like they really start to fear foods. And, you know, some kids like actually, like I have a few clients who are in high school, ones in middle school, who like need to have at every single meal in order to feel like doing something healthy for themselves. Like they can't do something without a fruit, right? And like so much of this goes back to what's healthy and what's not healthy. And kids don't need to know that information. Like it right. doesn't, they don't need that information. As parents and of course as a dietitian, you know, they're of course, we know there are some foods that are more nutrient dense and some foods that aren't, but it doesn't mean that we can't include them all and enjoy them all and normalize them all, right? And so then what happens is that, you know, kids go to elementary school and high school and like in their health assignments, right? Like you mentioned, they're, you know, asked to like track their calories or like what they ate in a day. And I cannot tell you how many times this leads to really really bad like negative patterns like you know people just fall right into an eating disorder from these types of assignments so like that is something that is really really tricky is that so many of these messages are being had at school so as far as parents are concerned you know I think the big thing is if your kid is home with an assignment like that and of course like it will vary depending on the age as far as like little little kids you know like kind of like you know taking that back a little bit okay like you know let's talk about like what are your favorite foods and what do you want to have for dinner tonight or like what should we have tomorrow or like like getting them involved that's a really big thing and saying you know like people do things differently in different homes in our home you know, this is what we do. And I have this conversation with my kids all the time, right? You know, in our home, we have, you know, all sorts of different types of foods with our meals. And you don't ever have to have this before you get that. Parents being able to say to their kids, like whatever age appropriate way we can talk about it. And also to parents or teachers, you know, my kid's not going to do that. My dietitian is happy to like talk to you about this or like, like, I'm always happy to have these conversations. I can't tell you how many times I, you know, talk to others about like, hey, yeah. I'm working on this with this person. You know, we don't need to do that. But saying like, you know, you don't have to do this, but they can do something else. But my kid's not going to do that. And there's so much data and so much research to show why. Like there's a lot of like, you know, research papers we can hand to people and say, this is why. This is like, why. It's really important, you know. Yeah, definitely. My, I know at, at our daycare, my, my daughter's two. And even in the, I think it was in the one-year-old class. It was when we first started this daycare. One of the teachers, I gave her like a few little chocolate chips with her lunch one day. Sometimes it's an Oreo. It just kind of depends. But the chocolate chips, for some reason, they didn't want to give her the chocolate chips. <laughs> they didn't want to give her the chocolate chips. And so, you know, one of the other teachers had shared that. And so then it challenged me as a parent to step in and say, you know, we, we really want her to eat whatever she chooses from her lunchbox, whether that's the chocolate chips or the apple or the peanut butter sandwich or whatever it is. And so sometimes these situations can challenge us as parents to, you know, advocate in ways that maybe we haven't done so in our lives in the past, which is hard. And keeping that in mind of like the the end game here is to have a normal as possible, right? Because we can't control everything relationship with food or to model that or set the stage for that, you know? And like you said, teachers and parents, no one's out there saying like, I'm going to do harm and really encourage an eating disorder today. But we have to assume that everyone's really operating from this place of like just diet culture messaging that doesn't acknowledge or see the harm in these, you know, seemingly little things of like, oh, no, you can't have chocolate chips because that will X, Y, and Z, whatever it is they think that like cause you to 
act right. wild or whatever. I don't know what the assumption was, but yeah, it starts so early and it's challenging. And if we can continue to step forward and advocate for our kids, it gets harder. I think when they're older too, I mean, it's all hard, but it feels like middle school and high school, they're up against a lot. Oh my God. They're up against so much. And again, like that's why it's just so important to normalize this for a kid's early age. Like, you know, not say like, I mean, actually like, sometimes I even say to, you know, my kids, like, Oh, well, your body's changing. Like you're so strong or like, you're taller, or, like whatever, you know, like, or like, they know like certain clothes don't fit anymore. Like, you know, it's like a normal, natural process to change, especially when they're kids. Um, so like helping them to normalize that makes a really big difference. And I think that, you know, the curriculum really needs to change in school at all ages. Like, you know, what if we taught things like, you know, how food grows and, you know, different varieties of foods and like for the little ones, like different colors and like, you know, how they taste and like, you know, textures and all of that. And then, you know, for older kids, you know, trying new things or like, making plates maybe like some like a little bit more colorful like it's fun to eat a rainbow because we eat with all of our senses and like you know like all these different things and normalizing that bodies are going to change and that like you're not supposed to stay the same height and weight for your entire life and I think like if that was emphasized a little bit more in school I think that would help to make things a little bit easier you know, in middle school and high school, it's so hard. It's really, really hard. And also, mm-hmm. like, people to, like, understand, you know, this is some, a conversation that I have all the time, too, is just, like, it's just mind-boggling that we accept for everyone, every other living thing on this planet comes in different sizes and different shapes and colors, like trees and plants and even dogs. And we never, ever, ever expect that a great dane would ever look like a chihuahua like no matter how it exercised or how little it ate it's not going to ever look like a chihuahua right yeah but then we accept that like people are like yeah like, that makes a lot of sense right then when it comes to humans it's like we're treated like you know almost like robots that like we should have the same hunger every single day especially if we're on the same schedule and that, you know, like, if you eat a certain way, you'll look a certain way, and that you should fit in, like, you know, normal range of BMI to be healthy, and that, like, you know, if you are in a larger body, there's something wrong with you, and it's just so harmful, right? Because if body diversity didn't exist, we wouldn't, like, we would come out of, we'd be born into this world looking all the same, right? We don't. Yes. We not look the same. Babies... Right all over the place, like all over the map, they're supposed to, because we are supposed to have different bodies and different shapes. We don't all need to be at the 50th percentile. So like accepting that body diversity exists, like from an early age, like literally the second you're born, you know, beings that really need to like be emphasized more to people, right? Yeah, definitely. And I'm curious if you have, because this has happened, my son, you know, is making more comments about bodies and people and, you know, natural curiosity of a four-year-old. And I'm curious how you support folks to respond to comments that kids are making from this really innocent and just observant place where maybe some people might be, you know, offended or have a lot of shame about their bodies. Um, how do you how do you navigate that or support folks to navigate that? That it's a tough one. It's a tough one because you know, like that's the thing that, and I love that you mentioned it too, is that like you know, kids are observers. So like observing is good and it's okay, and like they're going to ask questions. And I think it's just like as parents, it's like you know, like our own uh, our own like oh, history. Yeah. But like they're saying this, and like that would have offended me, and like you know, like it can get so stressful and feel like it can be such an anxious situation, but saying, yeah, like that person is that. I think like saying, yes, like, you know, pointing out that, you know, they are right. Like, yes, that person does have this, or that person does use a wheelchair, or, you know, that person does have a bigger belly than you or than mommy. Like, you know, how cool is that? Or like, you know, being in this like mindset of talking about 
you know, how these work or like what they do for us, like the amazing things they let us do. Then talking about appearance and also saying to them, you know, listen, like I, I see that you like are seeing that or like I know that you pointed this out. And, you know, a lot of people don't really like to talk about their bodies, you know, normalizing the fact that they are saying something, you know, because, you know, things are descriptors, right? Like that and tall, short, like big nose, little nose, like whatever that we, that they can point things out. And, you know, people don't always like to talk about it. So it's like to not comment on bodies because there's so many more interesting things about us than, yeah. you know, our size or our shape. But yes, it can be really hard. And depending upon the person, you know, depending upon their trauma or their history or whatever they've gone through, it can be, it can be really hard. So, you know, like taking it situation by situation, if somebody responds like in a really negative way, like then, you know, afterwards saying something to your kid, like, oh, like that was really hard. Like that person, you know, um, didn't like that you said that or that we said that or like you know whatever it is and that people don't like talking about their bodies because it's better to focus on all the things that they do and that's another thing when you had asked me like a few minutes ago about like things you can do in a body positive home and like I feel like I kind of got like fine <laughs> like no you've covered a lot <laughs> um, but there are a couple things that are coming to mind like the one thing is non-appearance based praise you know and non-food praise too like if we could stop saying good job for eating your carrots and like good job for eating your broccoli and like just like literally nothing um just like let it be so one of the things that I do with my kids that they really really love is we have these little fruit and veggie cutters or like little mini they come in all different like sizes and shapes I feel like they're a little mini but the different shapes so like butterflies and fish and an airplane and mickey mouse and dinosaur and all the things and i let them do it like you know i i steam the carrots and i make sure that they're really soft and they cool down and i get them both their little stool and they stand at the counter and they take the little like um cutters and their shapes and they love it and that's actually a really great thing that you can do even before the meal because you know if the kids are like really hungry and you're like oh like dinner's not ready yet but you like you want them to have something a little like veggie um you know beforehand is awesome and the shapes are so fun like you know mm-hmm. I, I, again not a one-size-fits-all I can also like provide you the link of the one that I use but that's also like another thing that might be really helpful to kids is just getting them excited about vegetables and not saying anything about like this is healthy for you it's just like we get the rainbow I get the rainbow Trader Joe's right they're purple and white and orange and yellow like they're really beautiful and we like the kids like pretend to have like the dinos eating each other really cute fun way to get them just eating vegetables without saying anything I'll do it too game out of it like you know those are the types of things yeah this like natural curiosity of you know you're you're playing every kid right is probably going to put what they're playing with in their mouth or at least my kids will you know so this natural curiosity of like what is this and you know without pressure without even comments of like huh yeah that's that's a purple carrot how cool is that right right exactly and like with broccoli we call them baby like my grandmother used to always say that. I love so, that. So we call them like little baby trees, like baby white trees and baby green trees. And like they love that too. And like, you know, we'll have like little trees and like they sometimes like compete to see who can be like, you know, the most baby trees. Like, and that's not even something that like I create. It's just like something that they do and like they have fun with it. And, you know, like the cookie is there. Like the other day we had a meal where they had a cookie. Um, They had their dino nuggets. They had... um carrots and they had strawberries and my daughter no it was broccoli and um strawberries and my daughter had a bite of the cookie first and then she like put it down and she had her dino nuggets and then she had her broccoli and then she like had another bite of the cookie and you know like and my son didn't even touch the cookie first like you know in the beginning they ate the cookie first and like Mm -hmm. here and they wanted more of that you know, do they sometimes want more cookies? Of course. And like, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. But the point is that like, they asked for three servings of broccoli. And it's because I never comment. I never say, 
good job for eating your broccoli or like, no, like you can't have more. Like it's always just like very neutral. Here's your plate. Enjoy, you know, and like I try to have the same with them. And that's also one more thing that's really helpful too is if you are having something different, that's a really, really neat way to get them to try it because doesn't every kid want whatever's on their mom's plate or their parents' plate? Like always. Oh. always. My daughter's like, no, yours. And I'm like, but yours is the same exact as mine. She's like, no, yours. I'm like, okay. Mine exactly. it is. Right. So like I'll let them me I'll feed them sometimes like we make a little like a back and forth like you take some of mine I'm taking some of yours you know like that kind of a thing and you know my son is actually very adventurous he's tried a lot of things like he just had like vegetable lasagna last night they won't be able to try it if they don't see it and it's not on their plate and it's not available so the try to make it fun and light and change the conversation nothing about it except for like how cool the shapes are and the colors and the pictures like whatever that's another thing that I really, really encourage parents to do at home. I know I have the toddler, the little toddler knives that we do a lot of chopping, yeah. lots of ninja chopping with. Uh, yes. Also fun too. Get them involved. They have fun, you know, and that's like another thing. A lot of times, like my daughter actually for her birthday got one of my friends and her like the cutest little like apron and like chef's hat and she loves it. It's like the cutest thing. And every time she's in it, she just wants to wear it. It's awesome. They just are so much they can do to help you and have fun with it like start this positive relationship with food and their bodies you know we have this innate ability to feel hunger and ask food and to stop when we're full and of course like we said we're not robots so like of course if something tastes really really good they might have more of it and that's okay like normalizing that they're humans they're exploring they're tasting things you know so that a really big thing like oh I'm so proud of you for you know you like that was really hard for you to do and you kept trying or like your smile just lights up the room or like there's a million things that we can say to kids that have nothing to do with their body size and what they're eating the other thing that I wanted to mention to you on that <laughs> while we're back here shows oh my god like, oh my know. gosh oh my god let's just take a minute for a second like wow it is crazy like the things that you pick I mean this is the hard part too because of course like our lives are busy right so like sometimes we put the tv on when we're trying to do something else like do dishes clean up make dinner all the things so like so we're not gonna always be to our kids while they're watching and um makes so much sense and I'm not saying that should always be like I'm definitely not and be mindful like I think it's really important to watch things before you show your kids oh my god every like Coco Melon I was like the dear Johnny I don't do you know yep yep I know my daughter loves to sing that song too and I'm like Ugh. the video is why like why do they think that this is like a normal thing for kids it's mind-blowing it is it's a two three four you know like younger actually one to three I think and it's like for people who don't know who are listening you know, it's like the mom and dad, like, sneaking food after a day's in bed. Like, they take turns in the kitchen, and then the other one comes in and sees them. And, it's like, they confront them about the food they're sneaking, and it's like, oh, my God, you know. And, and then they like, lie about it. And then they lie about it, right? And that, it's all messed up. It's horrible. The message is hidden in here, right? Yeah, it's incredible. Um, Me, the poo is an old one, but we actually have, like, we... We have a, we had a couple of books, but one, one of the books was like, you know, one of the books was like go into like the cave with the rabbit and he got in and when he was in there, he was hungry and he had a lot of honey and then he couldn't get out. So then rabbit weight shames him and says, oh, it's because you ate too much. And it's like reading this to my kids and I'm like, oh my God. So it's like a silly rabbit. Like the bear, it didn't fit through the hole because it wasn't built through a, for a bear. It was built for a rabbit. Like, look at the size of the bear versus a rabbit. Like, like what? So that we said bye to that. I mean, there's so many, like, blippy even. Oh, we yeah. Healthy food or, like, healthy lunch. And, like, we'll have, like, seaweed and an apple. And I'm like, well, you have something. And just, <laughs> apple and, like, seaweed. Like, really? Seaweed. And Peppa Pig. I mean... It, oh, Peppa, it, yeah. on and on and on and when you see it confront it like I think that's really important like, I am not bashful could be that's not a lunch like I'll say something like that like kids for like 
we know they're listening. They're, they're comprehending some of this. When Peppa Pig and family make Daddy Pig's belly, it's like, you know, I've called that many times. Many um, times, because it's like on repeat, yeah. Like, there's just, unfortunately, there are so many examples of this. Bernstein Bears, like the junk food book, like, oh my God. There's, it, this is why it's hard, right? Because, like, this is just like a like normal thing. Like, our books yeah. have all. And like the TV shows that we used to watch. I recently threw out a book too. It, there's a series, the Pig the Pug books. I don't know if you know them, but they're, they're cute. And there's one about like fibbing and, you know, Pig always learns a lesson. Pig the Pug always learns a lesson. And there was this one just like pink book that I think my brother got for my son. And he like loved it. He's like, oh, it's bright. It's great. And I was reading it. It was awful, awful. And so I immediately threw it out. Right. And so I'm going through and I'm like making up a story as I'm going through because I'm like, I'm not reading these words to my kid about, you know, pig eating too much junk food and whatever. And so I'm making up the words and I tossed it. You know, I'm like, this is wild that they actually have this in print. Crazy. I know. And like, even like a book that I had um, a little while ago that we no longer have, um, but it was an alphabet book, like a sleepy alphabet book. And it was like talking about all the letters. C, they called, like, C, D, and E were, like, getting into the bath, and they C, the adjective was chunky C, or chubby C, or something, and then, like, E, C, E, and, like, they showed, like, a big C, and a little E, and like, can we just let these, like, letters just, like, bathe in peace? Like, <laughs> just, like, just be letters. <laughs> letters. And I, so I wrote on the book, like, I'm not bashful to do that either, like, I'll take my pen, or I'll take my marker, and I'll I love it. And say like, you know, cheerful C or like enthusiastic E. Like, come on, can we think of something other than like gaming these letters? Get real, right? So, yeah, like come on. It's 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 everywhere. And so of course, you know, parents who aren't really in this like mindset, it's like you read these things and it's like totally normal and natural, but it's all these things that add up. And like shape how we view ourselves in this world and how we see ourselves. And it's no wonder that they feel so badly about their bodies. Like it's always these messages that bigger bodies are bad and thinner bodies are good. And it misses the mark in so many ways. It is so, so harmful because you can't, like health does not have a look. And we can't continue to operate from this mindset that health has a look and that you can tell a person's health by looking at them. It's so harmful for everyone. Yeah. And I'm just thinking of, you know, parents who may feel like shame for language they've used or how they've, you know, commented about themselves or food or whatever. And what just feels so important is that, you know, shame, like living in the shame spiral or, you know, staying stuck in shame, it doesn't serve anyone, right? So acknowledging like, oh, wow, like I made a misstep there, being really compassionate with yourself and acknowledging like you didn't create this, right? You didn't create this language about bodies or these beliefs about food or whatever, you know, it was planted long, long, long ago. And the more that you start to see it, the more you can call it out and kind of like coach yourself through it and get support to, you know, uproot some of this shit. So just to say, like staying in the place of like, oh my gosh, I'm so bad. I've caused so much harm. I think what we can do is really be gentle with ourselves and acknowledge like, okay, I have some work to do. And by stepping outside of shame, we're also modeling to our kids that, you know, resilience is a thing and you can stay resilient to these messages and you can grow and you can learn and you can uproot and it's all good. Yes. Like so much of that. Yeah. That's the thing too, is that like, and it is so easy to be like, Oh my God, like I messed up. And like now my (laughs) forever. I know. I think that like seven times a day, I'm like, Oh gosh, I've done it now. (laughs) Right. But like going back to this place where it's just like, okay, remind yourself that number one, you're human, you are doing the best that you can, and you have good intentions, and you want to be better, and you want to learn, and you want to improve. Um, And just because you have said things for however long doesn't mean that you have to continue to say them. We can change how we like talk, behave, live at any point. Like That's the beautiful thing about this is that 
we all have things that we would want to change or like, you know, reconsider or whatever. Um, and I think just being like mindful of that and really being self-aware of that and maybe like writing things down sometimes can be really helpful and say like, I am not doing this anymore. I am not going to do this anymore. These are the things that I'm going to start doing, stop doing, keep doing, whatever. And, you know, the more you do it, the more, like the better it becomes, the easier it becomes. And we're human, like nobody's immune to it, you know, no one, really no one's immune to it. But it is really important for kids to have, you know, good role models. And like the exercise too, like movement is a huge part of this and it does feel good. And, you know, like instead of saying like, oh, mommy has to go or like daddy has to go exercise because, you know, we had the birthday party yesterday, like none of that, like, please, no more, right? Moving our bodies feels so good and it is important in so many ways. And it doesn't, there's no one size fits all with this either, right? Like, but doing things with kids, like the kids love to be involved. I, we have like, you know, the Peloton app and I was doing, you know, like a workout from there. And my daughter came over and like got on the mat and like wanted to do things with me. And it's just like, cute. And it's like, like, you know, we were, we're talking about how like we're getting our bodies stronger and how it feels good. Like there's no talk about, you know, weight change or calories burned or whatever. It's just like, this feels good. And I said, I love doing this with you. This is so fun to do this together, right? So like go for walks together, do yoga together, have them pretend to lift weights like what my daughter was doing. You know, there's so many ways that we can go about this. And that's another thing that I think is really important because, you know, kids see, like kids see you have your salad and like your whatever instead of eating the same meal as them. And they see you go exercise right after you eat, like whatever you're doing, kids are aware. Like they notice, yeah. they notice what they think. Yeah, so, they're like little meeting making machines, right? Are. So what types of things do you want them to pick up from you, right? Like, what do you want them to see? And who do you want them to become? And of course, like, in so many ways, like, they're going to become who they become, who they become. But you know what I mean? Like, from behaviors and like things that we do, you know, the foundation that we set in our homes is so important. And so unfortunately, we can't keep our kids in a bubble. Like, I wish I could keep my kids in a bubble in many ways. We can do that they're going to get messages but what they know like and how they live at home and like the environment that we're in at home makes such a difference for them and it's so important and there's so many things that we can do to just help them to feel safe and loved no matter how their bodies change to normalize it all to hear them and you know be with them through all of it and you know those conversations, I think, really important, really important. Is there anything else you feel like you'd like to add before before we wrap up? Oh, gosh, there's so many things. I know. <laughs> Where do we end? <laughs> we don't. We do a part two. <laughs> yeah, we we'll talk about this for days on end. I really could. No, I mean, I think, honestly, like, again, I think just be, like, realistic and mindful, just, like, what what are the things that you are hoping to pass on to your kids? And like, what, what are things that are going really well? How are the, like, what are the ways in which you are already a really positive role model? And what are the things that maybe you can change a little bit? Like to maybe some small tweaks that you can just start doing today that will make a really big difference in the messages that your kids are hearing and seeing, you know, all of that. I think like that's the big thing. So being mindful of that is so important and having these important conversations. And if you feel stuck, you know, like there's so many people out there, like, of course, like, you know, my clients know this too. I'm always happy to have conversations with their doctors, with teachers, with like, you know, therapists, with whomever, like whoever I can talk to about this. And also just in case parents are wondering too, for little kids, I actually have these little like cards, like almost like these like notes because I was so paranoid about our daughter going to school and she went to school when she was three. And I was like, I am going to make sure that whatever goes in the lunchbox, she can eat in any order and not a single person makes a comment. I had a conversation with her teacher. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, like I had the conversation and she was like, oh, 
she was great about it. She was like, oh, yeah, like, you know, I assume that when people are sent, they can have whatever they want, you know, so I'm like, great. But if people need, I do have cards that you can put in your lunchbox so that it's not even on you. It's created by somebody else that says, please don't comment on my child's, you know, intake or like whatever. They can eat whatever they want in whatever order. If you have any, you know, you put your name on it, they call me, but like, you know, that can be a really great way to go about it too. If people need something like that, you know, those are available. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. I wish I had that yeah, I was a year and a half ago. I know, but yeah, like little things like that, whenever it's stuck, you know, there are so many people who are like happy and like willing to have these conversations for you. If you don't know how to have the conversation yourself and, you know, I love doing that. I love this work. I find it just so meaningful and it's the best, like having a positive impact on families and especially kids. Wonderful. So, yeah, well, the, the world is, is lucky to have you doing this work and your, your clients and tell everyone where they can find you, you know, if they're interested in kind of diving into this work a little bit more themselves for themselves or for their family. Yeah. Where can they find you? I am at Intune Nutrition Therapy. And so that's my social media handle. I'm not on social media a ton, but like I'm on there a little at my website at, you know, www.intunutritiontherapy.com. And, you know, feel free to email me too, like, you know, Robin at intunutritiontherapy.com. That's always a great place to do if you're, you know, needing help or anything like that. I'm always happy to, to have these conversations and to help. And there's just so many things, you know, that we can do and, even things that, you know, like we don't even, we didn't even get to today. So like mm -hmm. I'm here as a race and I'm always happy to help. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing about your work and really how to support people to create body positive homes, because we really, we really desperately need more of that in this world. That's for sure. Yeah, agreed. And thank you so much. I feel honored that you invited me on your podcast. So thank you for inviting oh. me important conversation. Of course. Please come back anytime for a part two or for something else. We'd love that. I would love that yeah. too. You. Awesome. Okay, everyone, be sure to check Robin out on Instagram and on her website. And we will also, um, I'll send you a list of resources and books and, you know, things if people are interested. So you'll be able to find that too. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And oh. okay, everybody, we will be back next week for another episode. Until yeah. then, take good care. <laughs>